Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. I can't believe some people are able to get into these positions when it's clear they're too stupid to be in that area in the first place. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. A manager told me not to do part of my job, so I didn't. This was a few years ago when I worked in a four-star hotel chain that would be very well known and was part of a larger company that had hotels of varying status. I was about 24. There were a few of us who worked primarily in room service and the breakfast shift was always a solo shift. One morning I started, and as was customary, I started doing my prep, folding napkins, setting up five, six trays with pastries, etc. per the pre-ordered breakfast cards, so I'd only need to grab the correct tea, coffee, and hot food later, as well as a few extra all-purpose trays for the people who call for room service last minute. i just get finished with this when the duty manager, I can't remember his full name, but nickname was Prem, bursts into the kitchen with a dirty plate in his hand and sees me in my area while putting it on the pile of dishes for the kitchen porter. He tells across the kitchen, What are you doing? It's so crazy out there that I have to help clear tables, and you're back here? Get out and help! I replied that I'd not gone up and walked the halls to collect the trays left out overnight yet, and he yelled some more and repeated that if he, a manager, is clearing tables, I better help regardless of if my job is actually in a different area. For the record, Prem was a menace. I witnessed him yell in college girls' faces until they cried several times. He'd also routinely pick on anyone that was minimum wage floor staff. So I walk into the restaurant and the supervisor, Jen, is at the door and sees me walk in, she covers for room service and has worked it in the past, so she knows I should be collecting trays by now so that the place doesn't look like a war zone upstairs. She asks if I've done this, and I say no. Prem sent me in to help because it's so busy. She says it's not very busy at all. They don't need me, and I should go upstairs and collect the dirty trays. I walk back into the kitchen, and Prem is still standing there. What are you doing? I told you to go in and help. I went in and Jen said they don't need me and told me to collect the trays. He then accuses me of going to her and asking can I go collect trays to get out of helping, so I tell him he can in and ask her if she called me or if I approached her. This satisfies him that I'm at least not lying, but he's still not happy. He says I'm the duty manager. Manager. Jen is a supervisor. I'm higher up, so you do what I tell you. Go in there and help clear tables. I don't want to see you going up to collect trays. I go back into the restaurant and Jen looks at me confused. I tell her that Prem insists that I help and won't let me go upstairs and says he outranks her, so she says I should join the guys at Station 1 and help their area. Breakfast passes and I pop out a few times to do my room services and come back with not much issue. My shift is until 3 p.m. and breakfast ended at 10.30. At this point, nobody has been upstairs and housekeeping will have been putting out dirty trays. I get a call on the room service mobile from a housekeeping manager saying that 4-4 has a dozen or so trays in the hall. I'm sorry, the duty manager has prioritized other areas at the moment and has said I cannot go up. I start doing my afternoon prep, polishing cutlery and the like. About 12 p.m. I get another call, this time from the housekeeping's top manager. She tells me there's trays everywhere, and I politely apologized and explained that my duty manager has used the exact words, I don't want to see you going up to collect trays. She accepts this without question and asks that I help when I can. At 2 p.m., I get a call from the hotel's director of operations regarding the trays. At this point, there are trays in the hallways on all seven floors, and the place looks filthy. Again, I politely explain what instructions I've received from Prem, and this is accepted without further question, and he says he'll inquire into it. 3 p.m. arrives, and I've not heard anything yet, nor have I cleaned up the pigsty upstairs. My replacement arrives, and I tell him what happened, and apologize for the fact that he'll have to collect these, but tell him why. He laughs and decides to leave it until somebody else calls and informs him they are there. Shortly after this, Prem left the company. And our second story. Don't want 60 seconds of adjustment? Okay, enjoy waiting six weeks. So I'm a dental assistant for a private practice. Let me just preface this by saying most of our patients are wonderful people. Friendly, happy to see us, respect our professional opinions and recommendations, etc. 
but literally just like three hours ago, I had the biggest Karen in for what should have been a simple appointment. So when we do crowns, or caps as some people know them as, we prep the tooth beforehand and take an impression, then that impression goes to a lab and the techs there make the crown. It takes two to three weeks for them to send the crown back. When we deliver the crown to the patient, the doctor and I try the crown in first to see how it fits. It's very rare that it fits perfectly. We almost always have to make some adjustments. Shaving down the crown here and there, checking the space in between the teeth, checking the bite, etc. All of this is standard. The main thing we use is called articulating paper. When the patient bites down on it, we can see heavy blue markings where the bite needs adjusting. The more we adjust, the lighter those marks get and even stop marking altogether sometimes. Most exchanges with the patient are like, how's it feel? It's a little high? Okay, we'll adjust that. We use the articulating paper, then grind the crown down a little bit. How does it feel now? Oh, feels much better? Okay, cool, let's cement it in. This takes maybe five minutes at most. This lady we had tonight was having none of it. How's it feel? Karen, ugh, it's way off. Us, okay, we'll adjust it. How's it feel now? Karen, the same. Us, um, really, no change? Karen, the same. Us, okay, no biggie. Let's adjust more. We did this maybe for five minutes over and over, and she kept insisting that it was exactly the same. No change. Even though the marks were gone at this point, meaning that her teeth were no longer even touching the crown. At this point, we had a couple options, which the doctor presented to her. Doc, okay, I can keep adjusting the crown. The only issue is that if I keep reducing the porcelain on top, the metal underneath might end up showing. Are you okay with that? Karen. No. Doc. Okay, well then I need to make a small adjustment to the tooth above this one so that they don't touch. It's very superficial. Karen. No, don't touch my other teeth. Doc. We do this all the time, ma'am. It doesn't harm the teeth. We're basically just polishing it. Karen. No, that's a lie. If you guys did it correctly the first time, you wouldn't have to adjust it at all. Me. Ma'am, we do this for everyone. The lab almost never makes them perfect. We either have to adjust the crown itself or the opposing teeth. Karen. No, you screwed up. Me. Well, we have to adjust one or the other, so which would you prefer? Do you want metal showing? Karen. No. Me. So we can polish the opposing tooth? Karen. No. Me. It'll literally take a few seconds. Karen. No, you're lying. It's going to harm my teeth. At this point, the doctor suggested getting our office manager to talk to Karen. Our office manager is an awesome lady. She's old, doesn't give a F, and is two years away from retirement. I told her the situation, and she laughed and said, okay, let's make her wait another month. I don't give a crap. LOL. So she marched right in there and said, okay, ma'am, since you don't want this crown, we'll send it back to the lab and have them redo it. So instead of just waiting the 60 seconds for us to adjust, she now has to wait three weeks to come in again. And that's just to re-prep the tooth. Then she has to wait another three weeks for the crown to come back from the lab again. Anyway, thanks for reading. I mostly just wanted to type this out to rant. I've been working as a dental assistant for almost a decade now, and I've never had an exchange like that. It was so bizarre. I straight up think she was either lying to our faces or just crazy. It made zero sense. I'd much rather have the work done correctly now, even if it takes a bit more time, than wait, especially when it comes to expensive and long procedures. And our last story. I need a fence along my driveway so my neighbors stop using it. I, 35-year-old male, have a driveway that goes along one side of my house to the backyard. A couple of years ago, my neighbors built a basement access and started renting the space out to tenants. The access is alongside my driveway, and past it, there's enough room for two vehicles to park, one in front of the other so that they block in one vehicle. Since they intentionally block in one vehicle, the tenants decided my driveway is fair use anytime they need to pull in or out of their parking spot. While this initially irritated me since they did not ask permission, I eventually spoke to the vehicle owner and got them to agree to cleaning up any mud they track across it and not compact snow before I've had a chance to shovel it. I've never been happy that they use it, but so long as they're not creating a mess I have to clean up, it's negligible. Plus, it seems impossible to monitor my driveway every day and try to file a report against the constant use. 
Recently, three months now, my brother, 36-year-old male who is living with me, passed away. It was an extremely difficult week emotionally. Thankfully, all my family made the trip to my state to help me sort through everything and made sure I was not alone during the subsequent weeks. Several days after his passing, I came home from picking up family from the airport and the neighbor's Jeep was parked right in the middle of my driveway. I was completely livid. I knocked on the tenant's and neighbor's door with no answer. I was literally looking up the number for parking enforcement when the neighbor's whole household came out to meet me, about five to six adults between the homeowner and tenants. They explained that they were moving their boat and figured they would only be occupying the space for a short time. I told them in no uncertain terms that they were not allowed to block my driveway for any reason, especially when I had so much family driving in from other states for the funeral. Before I'm asked, there is more than enough free parking on the street they could have easily parked in front of either house or across the street. Last week, the same tenants were in the process of moving out and again decided to park diagonally across my driveway so they could more easily move a mattress into their vehicle. This was really only an issue because my new roommates needed to grab medicine for their kid and were blocked in. I went out, told them they have to move, and if they need to use my driveway, they have to ask for permission. I'm tired of this constant battle for something I think should be common sense slash courtesy. I'm at the point where I will gladly pay a surveyor to come out, mark the property line, then build a one foot high spite fence along the driveway space. Knowing about where the line is, I'd be taking back about a foot of space they use for parking regularly along with intentionally creating an inconvenience for them. The homeowner is aware of the situation, but doesn't care. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.